according to St. John. The Gospel according to St. John. John 12. John 12. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, Why was not this ointment sold for three hundred pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief, and had the bag, and bare what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my burying hath she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you. 
but me ye have not always. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because that by reason of him many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. On the next day much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him, and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things unto him. The people therefore that was with him when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead bear record. For this cause the people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing? Behold, the world is gone after him. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven, saying, I have both glorified it, and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said, An angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. The people answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. And how sayest thou the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While ye have light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus, and departed, and did hide himself from them. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him, that the saying of Esaias the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me seeth him that sent me. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. 
He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. May God help us to be doers of the word. Amen. Yes, we should pity the man in this world who must use the earth for a bed. And I guess we should pity the man who must toil from dawn till dust falls bread. But this can be rich if they have contentment and sharing for salvation plan but if you know any who do they have plenty and lost then pity the man
But if while he's living to God is not giving, he's so and pity the man. Pity the man who has treasures to hold, and he goes on the tears of his crown. Oh, pity the man though he lives long or night, and he knows not the giver of life. Romantians, a builder who build on the sand. Papa rocking to be saved is the thing lost. Then pity the man. Praise the Lord. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the blessed time we have in your presence. Thank you for the revelation of your word. Without your word, the world will be in darkness, in the darkness of spiritual emptiness. But you've given us your word so that you will show us the way to live here and the power to live here and the possession we ought to have so that our lives will flow in the direction of your word and your will and to please you in everything. We're asking tonight, as we look at this word, the redemptive truth you have preserved for us will be ours in Jesus' name. We pray nobody will be absent-minded, and we pray Lord will be awake to hear you, and we'll see what you have for us in your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Grant us the grace, grant us the strength, grant us the enablement that we will be everything we ought to be for the glory of your name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Another amen. amen. God bless you. You can sit down. First Corinthians chapter 9, reading from verse 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. Here the apostle had been talking about the Christian life and the grace we ought to have in our lives, the strength we ought to have as we walk along, walking by faith and living by faith in the path that leads to ultimate uh, destination, which is heaven. 
and then he compares our Christian life with the race that the athletes run. And he says, as we run, we run to receive a prize. We run to receive the crown. And he's asking, as he asks them, he's asking us as well. He says, don't you know that they which run in a race, all of them run so that they can receive the prize. And then he says, you as a Christian, you as a child of God, you as a pilgrim on your way to heaven, so run in such a way that you will obtain the prize, obtain the crown. He tells us in verse 25, he says, and every man that striveth for the mastery, he wants to win in the race. He wants to get to the final destination and he wants to get there knowing that the Lord is waiting for him to receive the prize. Is he masters everything around him and is temperate, he's self denying in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. He says, all those people that run in the world, all those athletes that run in the world, the things they receive, the prize they receive, the crown they receive, will some fade away because it is temporary and because it is earthly and because it is corruptible. It says, but we and incorruptible that is the prize we're going to receive and the prize we're waiting for and the prize we're expecting at the end of the journey at the end of the race is an incorruptible crown it tells us in verse 26 and then it says i therefore so run he made himself an example to the Corinthians, an example to all the Gentiles, an example to all the believers. He said, I run. I run. I'm running. I'll keep on running until I see the Lord face to face, until the final reward is given. He says, therefore, I so run, not as uncertainly. He said, I am not doubtful. I'm not doubting anything about my race. At the beginning of the race, I saw the Lord Jesus Christ. I had the Lord Jesus Christ. He spoke to me. I know there is a destination. I know there is heaven. And also, I was taken to the third heaven, and I know that there is a place called heaven or paradise, the third heaven, and I know that I'm going to be there. And therefore, I so run, and I run with confidence. I run with certainty. So fight I, not as one beating the air, not as one wasting time and wasting life and wasting energy and wasting all my resources. I am fighting a certain, a certain fight and I know I'm not beating the air. It says because of that, in verse 27, it says, but I keep my body under to have the mastery. I have to be temperate and to overcome triumphantly. I have to deny myself and make sure that nothing hinders me in the race I'm running. It says that's why I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a cast away. He was saying, I'm watchful, I'm prayerful, I'm purposeful, so that on the final day, I will not hear, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, I know you not. He said, I don't want to be a cast away on the final day. That is why I keep my body under, put everything under subjection while I'm running the race. The topic tonight is running the race to obtain an incorruptible crown. Running the race, the Christian race, running the race, the race the Lord had set before us, running that race to obtain an incorruptible crown. We're dividing the message to three parts. Number one, running the race with persevering commitment. As we run the race, it's not enough to persevere just for one week or one month or one year. All through our lives, we're running the race with persevering commitment. Point number two, receiving the reward of a priceless crown. That's the goal. 
that's the purpose whatever we do now whatever we do any day whatever we do in the christian race if we don't get to the end if we don't get to the destination if we do not have eventually that priceless eternal crown then all would have been in vain that's the reason we want to see how to so on that we receive the reward of a priceless crown. Point number three is recognizing the reality of a possible cast away. That the possibility is there. That's why Paul the Apostle said that I keep under my body and I bring everything, everything, my body, everything, my thoughts, everything, my life, everything, all that surrounds me. I keep everything under subjection, under control so that at the end finally i will not be a castaway you'll not be a castaway in jesus name point number one now is running the race with persevering commitment have you seen any athlete how they jog how they exercise how they do everything not only at the for the olympic or for the time they're going to contest but every time every day of their lives they're preparing themselves and they're doing everything that needs to be done so that when that day comes they'll not be disappointed and that's why as we ourselves will think about the christian life about the christian journey about the christian pilgrimage and about the race we're running every day and every time and every moment we do not allow any time to pass when we slack back and when we throw down our shoulders our hands as if we cannot do anything the commitment the consecration and the sin that you push yourself into it's there every time you are not forgetful you are a spiritual athlete you are not forgetful that you are running a race it might be your place of work it might be in the home it might be in the church it might be with your friends it might be with your neighbors you want to understand every time that your life is the life of running a race that your life is the life of fulfilling the will of god and day by day and step after step taking all the steps you ought to take so that on the final day you will have a well done i will have a well done say it aloud we're coming now to first corinthians chapter 9 and verse 24 it says know ye not that they which run in a race run all but that but one receiveth the prize it then says so run is now saying not everybody in life is an athlete not everybody in life is a runner but now it says everyone in the kingdom everyone in the church every child of god the young and the old the boy the girl the man the woman everyone where to so run we are all at least spiritually so he says so run that ye may obtain that's your goal that's your purpose that's the reason you are a christian you are running the race in such a way that at the final day you will have the reward then he tells us in the first part of verse 25 he says in verse 25 and every man that has that, that must have the mastery is temperate in all things everyone that is running that race everyone that is uh, wanting to have the reward of the final day he must so run that he will have the mastery if he's going to have the mastery then he must strive lawfully he must strive loyally he must strive scripturally he must strive according to the thing that the lord has laid down and then he is temperate in all things there is no part of his life that is flabby there's no part of his life that is careless there's no part of his life that is fleshly there's no part of his life that is out of control every man every christian every believer every child of god running in the race must so run that he has the mastery and that he's temperate in all things that what temperate means self-controlled that means uh, that you are under the control of the spirit of god 
God under the control of the scriptures, under the control of the doctrines of the Bible, because you want to have the mastery as your own. In Hebrews chapter 12, reading from verse 1. Hebrews chapter 12, reading from verse 1, is still talking about running the race, and it's telling you, telling me, telling everyone what we have to do, how we ought to comport ourselves, how we ought to bring ourselves under control, and the things we need to get rid of in our lives so that we can strive for mastery and be temperate in all things. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. What does he mean by that? He's uh, giving us uh, Hebrews chapter 11, and then he's talking about Enoch. And he says that is part of the example we're given. He's giving us the example of Abel and Abraham and Noah and Sarah and uh, Isaac and Jacob, and then of uh, the parents of Moses and of Moses and of all the other prophets in the Old Testament. And he says, what shall I say more? Time will fail me to talk about this, this, and that. And he's saying now, he puts everything all together in a conclusion. And it says, they ran their race. And you are now running your race. It says, we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. It says, now let us lay aside every weight. It's telling us, no athlete was strapped on a 20 pound belt and then he's running the race. He wants to be as light as possible so that there is no weight that will weigh him down, so that there is nothing that will impede his speed because he wants to win. Therefore, every kind of weight and every kind of load he'll shed off, he'll throw off, he'll cast off so that he can run the race appropriately. That's why he says, we now, as we're running the race, let us lay aside every weight, every weight, whatever will weigh you down, the things of the world, the pressures of the world, and the interaction in cobrances of the world, whatever will weigh you down, that you will not be able to run at the speed you ought to run. You'll not be able to run loyally. You'll not be able to run scripturally. You'll not be able to run according to the purpose and the plan and the calling of God for your life. Whatever will hinder you, whatever will slow you down, whatever will put any pressure on you, that you will not be able to run appropriately, lay that aside and the sin that so easily besets us, the sin that will normally come and will hinder I will prevent, and you'll not be able to run. When there's guilt on the conscience, you cannot run well. And when there is a condemnation on your conscience, you cannot run well. When your conscience is knocking every time, saying you are backsliding, you have committed sin, you have yielded to that thing again, you've done that evil thing again, you are praying, it comes to mind, you are reading the Bible, it comes to mind, you want to do anything, all that comes to mind, it says, if we're going to run, and we're going to win the victory. If we're going to run, and we're going to have the well done of the Lord, every which we must lay aside. And the sin that does so easily beset us, we must lay aside. And look at this, and let us run with patience. That's perseverance. Let us run purposefully. Let us run intelligently. Let us run according to the dictates of the Spirit of God in our hearts. Let us run with patience, perseverance, the race that is set before us. You cannot set another race. You cannot raise up a different standard. It's the same standard of the Word of God and the doctrine that Christ has given us. And it says that is what to focus on. You see, there are people that will set another race, not the race that the Lord had said. They have a standard that is lower than the New Testament, and they have a standard that excuses their besetting sin 
they have a standard that will justify whatever they do and they think that the age justifies that means it says abandon the kind of praise because that one will not take you to heaven the race that will take you to heaven is the race he himself had said and let us run with patience and let us run with perseverance and let us run with the power of God in us the race that is set before us it tells us in first Peter chapter 4 reading from verse 2 first Peter chapter 4 and we're reading from verse 2 it says that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lost of men but to the will of God what is telling us here is the running of the race implies that we're walking and we're living and we're acting out the will of God not the lusts of men not the desires of men we're not living by the philosophies of men by the principles of the world we're not living by the practice of our neighbors we're not living by the low standard of the sinners and backsliders in the world but the will of god which is holy the will of god which is high the will of god which is heavenly we're walking by that will of god it tells us in verse 3 in verse 3 he says for the time past of our life may suffice us to have brought to have wrought the will of the gentiles he said when we were blind when we were christless when we didn't have salvation in the past before we became converted and before we came to the cross he said that time is enough we've served the devil enough in the past we've walked with the people of the world in the past we've walked we've walked in the principles in the precepts in the proverbs in the practices of the corrupt world and that's enough he says now when we walked in lasciviousness in the past laws excess of wine and revelings and banquetings and abominable idolatries but now look at verse 4 in verse 4 he now says wherein they think is strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot speaking evil of you he says we're not running and we're running the christian race and the christian race we're running is playing the Christian race we are learning is very clear. If you are a young person, the way you behave, the way you live your life, all the other young people around you, they are wondering, how could you live like this? How could you be doing that? Everything straight, everything honest, everything biblical, everything Christian. How can you do that? It says wherein they think it's strange. They think conversion is strange. Transformation is strange. Holy life is strange. A pure life to them is strange. If you're working in an office where everybody tries to change this and turn this their own way and they want to practice fraud and they are calling you to be part of them. It looks strange when you say, no, I'm satisfied with what I have and the blessing of God will be on what I have. I don't have to be fraudulent. And then when you're a young man, you're a young woman and you're not giving your body to immorality morality and there's no fornication there's no adultery and you are just walking in your life a straight life a pure life and then they are surprised they say you are strange how can you be like this a young man like yourself a young lady like yourself and not have a boyfriend not have a girlfriend and not have a same partner wherein they think is strange that she run not with them to the same excess of riot you are not in the nightclubs and you are not in any violent uh, habit and you are not uh, watching the appeal the cinema and you are not watching any of those pornographic things and they wonder how do you spend your life how do you live your life if you're not into this if you're not into that that is the life of a person that is running the race with persevering commitment they think it's strange that we run not with them to the same excess of riot speaking evil of you 
but praise the Lord, we'll keep on doing what we're doing because we're running a race and that race will take us to heaven in Jesus' name. It will take me to heaven. I said it will take me to heaven. Now, the apostle tells us some people that ran before and they lived before according to the word of God. But now something snapped and something changed. We're looking at Galatians chapter 5 and we're reading from verse 7. Galatians chapter 5, we're reading from verse 7. Here Paul the apostle was telling them, you did run well. The time I knew you, when you were converted, when you were born again, when you started studying the scriptures, you did run well. The time I knew you, when everything turned around and then you became new creatures in Christ, you did run well. The time I knew you, when the love of God filled your heart and you walked according to the way of the Lord and the restitutions you ought to make, you corrected everything, you cleansed your life, all the things you told you returned everything and all the lies you told you corrected everything you say i don't care what people think about me i want to live the christian life i saw you at that time i knew you at that time you did run well who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth the galatians said uh, they slowed down they turned back they adjusted things, they tried to cut corners, and they were now very diplomatic, and they were not sincere anymore. And Paul the Apostle said, I'm surprised about you, that you are no more running, and you are no more walking, and you are no more as sincere, as diligent, and you are no more as temperate, you are no more as self-controlled as you used to be. You did run well, who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Look at verse 8. In verse 8 it says, This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. Whosoever, who, whoever it was that came to persuade you that holiness cannot be at the level of the Bible, whosoever came to persuade you you don't have to be righteous every time you don't have to be righteous in every detail and every part of your life and you don't have to make everything correct and everything standard and everything according to the foundation of the christian faith that the lord had given us he said whosoever persuaded you to turn around and not to live at the level of the consecration you had before he didn't do well this persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. Look at verse 9. It says a little leaven, leafness, the whole love, a little leaven, a little adjustment, a little compromise, a little theft, a little lie, a little deception, a little dishonesty, a little hypocrisy. Uh, that's what the Corinthians, the Galatians were not doing. They were adding some little, little things that will just make them to be more like the world. And Paul the Apostle said, that's not running the race. If you are running the race, all those little, little termites that come in uh, and all those little foxes, everything must go away from your life and then you must focus on the race the Lord has called you to run. A little leaven, uh, leafness, the whole Lamb. It tells us in Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 14. Philippians chapter 2, we're reading from verse 14. It says, do all things without murmurings and disputings. That's the race. That's the race. Everything you do, you're giving something to somebody. Do it cheerfully. Do it happily. Do it joyfully. And do it sincerely. Do it wholeheartedly. Do all things without memories and disputes in your spiritual life. You're reading the Bible. Do it cheerfully and do it like this. Is the great thing I have to do. Or you are praying. Do it without memory, without disputing. You are evangelizing. Do all things without memories and disputes. And you are obeying the scriptures, obeying the word of God. And you are serving the Lord with sincerity of heart. Do all things without memories and without disputes in verse 15 it tells us that she may be blameless that's the standard that's the standard some people say i know i have my own blemish 
Why do you keep the blemish? I know I have my own fault. Why do you keep the fault? I, I know I have my own abortion and all that in my life. Why should you keep that? If you're going to run the race, all those things you push aside, all those things you set aside, and it says that he may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom he shine as lights in the world. And then he tells us in verse 16, it says, holding forth the watch of life. That's running, that's running the race, holding forth the watch of life. Anything you do, everything you do, you have a clear scripture to back yourself up. You say, this is the word. My light is going to shine. This is the word. I'm going to be the light of the world and the light of my community. I'm going to be the salt of the earth. And you live by the word every time. It's not like somebody will open the Bible to you and then you say, well, I'm sorry I didn't remember that when I did that other thing. Then we open another one. I'm sorry I didn't remember that when I did that, that other thing scene it says the watch of god must guide our lives must gird our lives and in our behavior in our character in the way we live in everything we do we're showing forth and holding forth the watch of life then it says that i may rejoice in the day of christ it says philippians you are my converts Philippians, you are the disciples I'm developing. And if you live according to the word and you run the race the way you ought to run in the day of Christ, I will rejoice that I have not run in vain. When you are preaching and the people you are preaching to are not converted and you are not preaching about conversion, you are just teaching Bible, Bible knowledge that doesn't bring conversion. When you, are, when you are pastor and you are pastoring people and you are not discipling them and you have the people, they are forgetting the good old days and they are forgetting the ancient landmarks and they are forgetting the standard of holiness by which we ought to live. But you don't care, you are just a pastor and you are preaching, everybody is having a nice time and they don't make heaven at last then you have run in vain. You have labored in vain. It is better you come back to the word and the things you teach will bring conviction and it will bring conversion and it will bring consecration that the members, the people who are hearing you will come back to the word and run the race with perseverance and commitment. So Paul the apostle said, it is when you live by the word, you are holding forth that word of life, I will rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. How, how can we do that in our lives to have that such a power and such commitment that we will not be tired and every time and every day we're moving on and we're running the race up appropriately. Look at Galatians chapter 2, reading from verse 2. Galatians chapter 2, we're looking at verse 2. It says, and I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation privately to them which are of, uh, of reputation. You know what Paul the Apostle is saying? Paul the Apostle said, I got the heavenly vision and then I got the vision and I've been running and I've been running, preaching the gospel everywhere. But then I said, wait a moment. I need to go to the people that, that received the commission originally and compare notes and tell them what I've been preaching and tell them what I've been doing and tell them what my manner of life is. I don't want to be in isolation and I don't want to deceive myself and say, I know it all. 
whatever they're doing at the headquarters of Jerusalem and let them hold on to that. He said, I came to them by revelation and revealed to them what I've been doing, lest by any means I shall run or I run in vain. Do you ever do that? Do you allow a brother, a sister, to discuss with you on what we have learned in the watch of God? Or do you say, keep your ideas to yourself, I know myself? Do you allow your husband to pick you up and say, my wife, look at what we heard, and look at this, look at this, and then you frown and say, what's the matter? Am I a backslider? Why are you telling me that? If you're a real child of God, you want to allow your wife to talk to you, your husband to talk to you, your neighbor to talk to you, so that you will not run in vain on the final day. And you want to allow your pastor to, to talk to you and call you and say, hi about this and hi about that. How does that go? How has that been going on? You're not frowning and saying, uh, well, you've taught the Bible study and you preach the message, let it stop there. Don't bug me and don't follow after my life. Paul the apostle said, I went to them who are of reputation, who know more than I know, so that I can listen to them. I don't want it to be on the final day. The Lord will tell me you ran in vain or you had run in vain. I pray you'll not run in vain. I will not run in vain. Look at verse 20. In verse 20 it says, I am crucified with Christ. That's the only way to live the righteous life and to live the holy life. And that is the only way to perseveringly live with commitment. If self is not crucified, if that uh, a kind of uh, ego in the heart is not crucified, if the nature of pride in the mind, in the heart is not crucified, you'll be running, but you'll not run the race the way God expects. And Paul, the apostle, said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. When Christ lives in you, the life he would have lived if he was in the world today, every word of your mouth, every action of your hand, every thought of your heart, everywhere you go, everything you see, everything you contact, when Christ lives without any inhibition and without any hindrance, that's how to run the race. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith, not by unbelief. I live by the faith, not by doubting. I'm not sure of what I'm doing. I'll do it in any case. I don't know whether this is right or wrong. I'll do it in any case. That has not the life. The life that lives by faith, dynamic faith, the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If we're going to run like that and run acceptably and run uh, before the Lord and God will say that is good, that's what I expect. How do we do that? In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. Isaiah chapter 40. We're looking at verse, uh, verse 31. It says in chapter 40 of Isaiah, and in verse 31, it's talking about the strength we have and the power we have, and it's talking about the stability we have to run and not be weary, and then to walk and not faith, and then we have to wait on the Lord. We have to take what we're hearing to God in prayer, and we have to look at everything. I've had this. How does my life match with that? How does my life go along with that? And it is that, as we wait upon the Lord, it strengthens us, and then we're able to run with the energy and the power of the Spirit. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, but they that wait upon the Lord, that's praying, watch and pray, that you don't fall into temptation, watch and pray, that your life will be straightforward and your life will be glorifying unto God. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run 
they shall run, they shall run. They've been waiting upon the Lord, and the Lord has renewed their strength. They have been waiting upon the Lord, and the Lord has empowered them. And it says, they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk, and they shall not faint. I pray that power to run, and that strength to run, and that spiritual energy, ability to run, to please the Lord, will be in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number two now. We're running to receive the reward of a priceless crown. We're back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 25 and 26. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, reading from verse 25. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate, is self-controlled in all things now. They do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. They in the world, they who are sinners, they who are only playing games that do not take them to heaven. It says they do all that to obtain a corruptible crown, a crown that will fade away, a crown that even while they're still in, in, in the world over here, they'll forget the joy of that day. It says it's just corruptible crown, but we and in corruptible and eternal crown a crown that will never fade away in verse 26 it tells us i therefore so run you know paul the apostle uh, paul the apostle was not like do as i say you run but leave me alone don't mind what i do you cannot be a pastor a preacher an apostle and say i don't do it that's not my stop but the church is to do that you cannot be a good father if you tell your children just do what you are hearing in the church as for me daddy you know i am daddy if you're going to be a real father you have to show the example you cannot say as a mother you my daughters make sure you live straight make sure this doesn't happen that doesn't happen but i but you mommy but you do such a thing uh, that you are telling us not to do uh-uh don't speak back to mommy. Mommy has the right to do anything. Sister, mommy does not have the right to commit sin. Mommy does not have the right to compromise. What you tell the children to do, you too, you must abide. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. You'll see here that Paul the Apostle himself, he wanted to run the race and he wanted to do the will of God in such a way he will triumphantly get to heaven. He tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 4 there, 2 Timothy chapter 2, reading from verse 4, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. No man that worries, no woman that worries, no believer that worries entangles himself herself with the affairs and with the activities of this world. What leaders that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. All you want every time is that anywhere you are, whatever you are doing. You are pleasing the Lord who has chosen you to be a Christian soldier. And then he says in verse 5, in verse 5, And if a man also strive for masteries, masteries in the plural, you look at every area of your life, you want to master that deficiency. You want to master that a kind of a flaw in your character. You want to master that a thing that you know is not right. You want to be on top and you want to live in such a victorious life, a triumphant life. You strive for masteries in every area. You don't excuse any any kind of iniquity as an infirmity that's my infirmity that's my weakness that's my whatever it says no if you want if you are running to please the lord you must strive for masteries and yet if you don't do that you cannot be crowned it says yet is not crowned except is strive lawfully 
is strive lawfully. You are not fighting or striving against the word of God. You are not striving against the doctrine. You are not striving against the preacher. You are not striving against the standard of the word. You are, you are striving you know, and fighting against your own corruption, against your own deficiency, so that you strive lawfully and then you have a life that is glorifying unto the Lord. It says in, um, in um, James chapter 1, reading from verse 12, temptation will come, trial will come, and the one who wants to receive the crown of life and the crown of righteousness must strive lawfully. That is what we're expecting, a precious crown, a priceless crown. It says in James chapter 1, verse 12, blessed is the man and blessed is the woman that endureth temptation, endureth trial, endureth difficulty. It's not like every time there's a challenge on the way of the Christian, then I have to compromise, I have to bend, I have to yield. Every time there is opposition, every time there's persecution, I have to think of what I'm going to do and cut corners and bend a little. It says we stand. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the Christian. The Christian that is striving for the mastery and the Christian that is living a life that is acceptable unto God. Blessed is that man. Blessed is that believer that endures temptation for when he strides, he shall receive the crown of life. When he strides and he doesn't bend, when he strides, it doesn't compromise. When it's tried, it does not yield. When it's tried, it doesn't join them because it cannot beat them. When he is tried, it doesn't become like one of them and keeps on standing. Blessed is that man that endure temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him has promised them that love him. When you love the Lord, every time you want to do as he wants you to do, as he bids you do, as he commands you to do, that's the love of God. And that is what makes us to win the crown. Eventually, we're told in First Peter chapter 5, reading from verse 4. In First Peter chapter 5, from verse 4, and when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. That's the incorruptible crown. The crown that fadeth not away, the reward that fadeth not away, and with the stars in your crown. And it fades not away all through eternity. It tells us in Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2, we're looking at verse 11. In Revelation chapter 2, reading from verse 11, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Look at this. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second day. There's going to be a final separation. There's going to be a permanent separation. That separation is called death. Death is separation, separation from the eternal God forever and ever. When you overcome, trials come, temptations come, ideas come, and something wanting to draw you into evil, and you say, no, I'm running a race, and I'm going to run victoriously and triumphantly until I get to heaven. It says there'll be no second death. And then it tells us in verse 10, Revelation chapter 2, and reading there from verse 10, it says, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. You know, if we're going to live the Christian life and run the race, the people around you may not understand all the details of the race you're running. They may not understand your commitment, your consecration, your straight life, 
and the standard of the word of God you are following, they say, if you will bend a little, compromise a little, everybody will be happy because then you will come to their level, the level that has no grace, the level that has no prayer, and the level that has no commitment will you come to their level. But if you say, I'm going to keep on running, and I'm going to keep the level Christ has given to me, and I'm going to run perseveringly with purity of heart, uh -huh, you're going to suffer. There will be persecution from almost every direction, but Jesus said, fear none of those things, we thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that he may be tried, and ye shall have trial, temptation, tribulation, trouble, ten days. Be thou faithful unto death. Be thou faithful unto death. And I will give thee a crown of life. That crown is awaiting me, awaiting you, and will run victoriously, triumphantly unto the end in Jesus' name. A good church, amen. amen. Revelation chapter 3, we're reading from verse 11. Revelation chapter 3, reading here from verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. It says, you've been running the race since you were born again in the private, in the public. Remember your early Christian life, how you ran the race transparently, how you ran the race without compromising. Be, be, uh, remember in your early Christian life, uh, everything you read in the word of God that is speaking to me and that is how I'm going to live whether people agree with it or not. He says, now I'm coming and the time of my appearance is very near. Hold fast that which you have that no man take thy crown. Nobody will take your crown. And I hope and I pray you'll not drop it down by yourself in Jesus' name. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, it says, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God and I will write upon him my new name. I pray none of us will miss all that in Jesus name. The Lord wants us to soon live and comport our lives without compromise, without corruption, without unbelief, without looking back and walk the straight path, not a crooked path, not a sinful path, and not a fleshly path, so that as the Lord look at our lives, he will know that we have done everything and we're doing everything to the glory of God as somebody expecting the reward on the final day. In Colossians chapter 3, reading from verse 23. Colossians chapter 3, we're reading from verse 23, and whatsoever ye do, and whatsoever ye do, and whatsoever ye do, do it heartily. Have your heart in everything you do. Have your mind in everything you do. Put your skill in everything you do. Put your learning in everything you do. All that you are learning at the Bible study, at the Sunday worship, at the Tuesday leadership development meeting, on Saturday, everything on Thursday as well, everything you have read, everything you have learned in the Word of God, when you put your heart to it, that you live by the standard of the Word of God, and you're listening to the messages over and over, and then you match every action, and you match every proposal, and you match every plan, and you match every activity with the standard of the Word of God, that's how to live to please the Lord. It says whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. In verse 24, it tells us, knowing that of the Lord, ye shall receive the reward. Of the Lord, ye shall receive the reward for ye serve the Lord Christ. 
the reward of an inheritance eternal inheritance in verse 25 it says but he that doeth wrong nobody will know this he that doeth wrong I can hide this. He that doeth wrong, I know this is not the way, and this is not the standard, and this is not the will of God, but in my weakness now, and in my, the way I feel now, that's all I can do. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he has done. And there is no respect of persons with God when it comes on that final day. There is no respect of persons. Therefore, anywhere you are and whatever you are doing, you'll say, I know the Lord is watching me now. I know the Lord is seeing me now. Will he be happy with this on the final day? Will this one win an incorruptible crown on the final day? Will this be termed conquering or compromising on the final day? So that everything you do, you do according to the desire and according to the will of God. In Revelation chapter 22, we're reading from verse 12. Revelation chapter 22 we're reading from verse 12 and behold i come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man you see that to give every believer to give every child of god to give every man every woman according as his work shall be according as his work shall be according as his life shall be according as his activities and actions according as his work shall be in verse 13 it says i am alpha and omega the beginning and the end the first and the last in verse 14 it says in verse 14 blessed are they that do his commandments that's how to run the race and to run with you standing firm on the word of God, on the declaration of the word of God, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gate into the city, the holy city, the heavenly city, the eternal city. But in verse 15, it tells us, for without our dogs, and sorcerers, and all mongers, those are adulterers, and murderers, and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Whosoever loveth and manufactures a lie. You know, there are people who say they are Christians, and any little question you ask them, it just come rolling in their head, they manufacture a lie, and throw it at you and they've done it so habitually and they don't think that amounts to anything at all they do it like that every time but the lord says outside the kingdom are the dogs outside the kingdom are the witches and the wizards and the sorcerers outside the kingdom are the all mongers adulterers fornicators outside the kingdom are the murderers and the idol worshippers and whosoever 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 loveth and maketh a lie I pray on the final day you'll not be found outside the kingdom you'll be inside in Jesus name we're coming to point number three now point number three recognizing the reality of a possible castaway Paul the Apostle tells us in first Corinthians chapter 9 reading from verse 27 it says but I keep under my body you're an apostle you have to keep under your body I have to a preacher a prophet an evangelist a pastor a teacher you have to keep under your body yes I have to you have a high position in the church and you are recognized as a key leader and without you we cannot have this revelation that revelation you still have to keep under your body yes I have to both I keep under my body 
Timothy will not do it for me, is younger, and Titus will not do it for me, I keep under my body, and all those uh, men and women in the church, they love me, they are praying for me, and he told the Roman Christians, pray for me, he told them, Ephesians chapter 6, pray for me, that I might have a straightforward a teaching of the word of God, he told the Thessalonians, pray for me, but all those people praying for him cannot keep his body under for him. I keep under my body. In your personal life, you have to do that for yourself. You have to recognize your getting saved is your personal choice. And your remaining in the kingdom is your personal choice. And you're wanting to get to the end and the destination is your own choice. And because of that, whatever activity, whatever position, and whatever title you have, you have to do this for yourself. I keep under my body. You cannot keep other people's body under for them. You can preach to them, you can counsel them, you can pray for them. It is still the responsibility of everyone that they keep under their body. What does that mean? Their eyes, they keep that under control. Their ears, they keep that under control. Their mouth, they keep that under control. And their other organs of the body, they keep that under control. And their feet, where they get to, where they go to, they keep that under control. And their hands, what they do with their hands, they keep that under control. Everyone has to do that by himself now. What do you think will happen in our world if everybody loses control? As we're here now, uh, you know, you lose control of your mind, you lose control of your body, and then you act the way, and your brain suggests that one is acting, that one is acting. There'll be chaos, there'll be pandemonium, and there'll be confusion. And therefore, if the church is going to be the church, and if the family is going to be the family, everyone must keep himself, must keep herself, the tongue, the eyes, the ears, and the every part of the body keep that under control so that we can run the race aright and win the crown it says but i keep under my body and bring each into subjection lest that by any means when i have preached to others i myself an apostle i myself a chosen minister I myself, an appointed minister of God, I myself should be a cast away. What did, what did he mean by that? A cast away. We're looking at Hosea chapter 9, verse 17. Hosea chapter 9, we're reading from verse 17. It says, my God will cast them away because they did not hack in unto him as we hear the word of god if we don't uh, hack in if we don't listen if we don't obey if we don't apply it to our hearts it says my god will cast them away because they did not hack in unto him and they shall be wanderers among the nations it tells us in jeremiah chapter 6 verse 30 jeremiah Chapter 6, reading from verse 30, it says, Reprobate silver, shall men call them? Reprobate silver, rejected silver, corrupted silver, useless silver, worthless silver, shall men call them? Because the Lord has rejected them. After we come into the kingdom, we need by grace to abide in the kingdom, by his power to abide in the kingdom, by the teaching of the word of God to abide in the kingdom, by personal consecration and commitment to abide in the kingdom. It says otherwise, reprobate silver shall men call them because the Lord has rejected them. In um, First Chronicles chapter 28, reading from verse 9, First Chronicles chapter 28, we're reading from verse 9. This is uh, David talking to the son and said, Thou Solomon, my son, know the God of thy father and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts of the thoughts of the earth. If thou seek him, 
he'll be fond of thee. And you know, fathers have to be sincere with their boys, with their girls, with their sons and daughters. Heads of families have to be sincere with members of the family. And the pastor has to be sincere with members of the church. Like David was sincere with Solomon. And he said, if thou seek him, he, shall, he will be found of thee. Look at this. But that if thou forsake him, if thou Solomon, a chosen son, a beloved son, if thou Solomon, an appointed son, and a person that is going to build the temple and the sanctuary, the tabernacle of the Lord, and if thou Solomon forsake him, he will cast thee off, not only on earth, but forever. He was so sincere to Solomon, and he said, Know the God of your father, and serve him with a pure heart and with a perfect heart and serve him with a, a transparent heart if you keep on seeking him you'll find him but if you forsake him and you go back to idolatry and you go back and you go to polygamy and you go to all those sins of the flesh he will cast you off not only here on earth he'll cast you off forever and that means we need to keep on following the Lord so that we'll not be cast off. I pray the grace of God will remain and abide in our lives so that we will not be cast off in Jesus' name. We're coming to Matthew chapter 13. We're reading from verse 47. Matthew chapter 13. We're reading from verse 47 again. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind he's talking about the religious world he's talking about the visible church we throw out the net of evangelism and the net of preaching and we gather in quite a lot but look at what is going to happen on the final day when God begins to sort out all the fish that came in, all the converts that came in, all the members that came in. In verse 48, it says in verse 48, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the goods to, into vessels, but cast the badge away. It's not automatic, I'm coming to church, and therefore heaven is certain. That is, if you allow the grace of God to turn your heart and to transform your life, you become good, you become righteous, then you'll be gathered into the vessel. But if nothing changes, if language does not change, if character does not change, if behavior does not change, you were in the dark before and you're still walking in darkness, you were stealing before and you're still stealing, adultery before, you're still committing adultery, fornication before, you're still into fornication, stealing before, you're still stealing now and nothing has changed, you remain as bad as you were before on the final day when the good, the righteous, the converted, the pure and the holy will get into the kingdom, then the Lord will cast the bad away. Look at verse 49. In verse 49, so shall it be at the end of the world, the angels shall come forth and sever them and separate them, the wicked from among the, the Jews. In verse 50, in verse 50 it says, and shall cast them, cast them, this casting away, cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. I pray that will not happen to you. But if it's not going to happen, you must follow the Lord. You must allow the grace of God to come into your life. You must allow real conversion and commitment to the Lord and walking in the way of the Lord. It tells us in Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, reading from verse 23. In Luke chapter 9, reading from verse 23, And he said unto them all, and he said unto them 
all is not a special message to a special group of people. He said unto them all, anyone claiming to follow the Lord, anyone that claims to be a Christian, anyone that says he's running the race and he wants to get to heaven, and he said unto them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, put your body under Put your mouth under control, put your ears under, under control, and put your mind under control, and put your eyes, what you read, what you watch, put everything under control. Let him deny himself and take up his cross daily, and take up his cross daily, and follow me. Then in verse 24, he tells us, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, lose his reputation for my sake, and lose his uh, conveniences for my sake, and lose his luxury for my sake, and lose the easy life for my sake, and lose the ego, and lose the self-life for my sake, whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Now verse 25, it says, in verse 25 for what is a man advantaged what is a man profited what's the gain for a man religious man christian man christian woman religious man religious woman for what is a man advantage if he gain the whole world all the money in the world all the wealth in the world all the reputation of the world, all the respect of the world, all the friendship of the world, and all the flattery of the world, what is a man advantage? If he gain the whole world and lose himself, or be cast away, or be cast away. That's why the Lord wants us to so live our lives in the grace of God, in the experience of salvation, in the experience of sanctification and holiness, without which no man shall say the Lord. He wants us to so live that we will not be cast away at last. I pray you will not be cast away. But must pray and have the power of God and the strength of the Lord upon our lives. Uh, let's come back now uh, to First Corinthians chapter nine. We're reading from verse twenty-seven. First Corinthians chapter nine, reading from verse twenty-seven. But I keep under my body. I keep under my body. It says, "Was spirit." soul and body and i do not allow my body to ruin my spirit and to destroy my soul i make my spirit number one and i make my eternal destiny number one and i make use of the strength and the power of my spirit to keep my body under he says when the time comes to die the body will be buried in the grave, and the spirit and the soul will go to God. I do not want that body, which is the least important of all my personality. I do not want that body to hinder my spirit and my soul rising and going to heaven. Therefore, I use the strength and the power and the energy of my inner man to keep under my body and bring it to subjection like a slave that my body will serve my soul and my spirit it is not that my spirit will be subservient to my body and to my flesh and whatever it wants it just run after that it says my spirit will be in control my inner man will be in control and through the strength spiritual strength of that inner man i bring the body into subjection less by any means when i have preached to others i myself think about that i myself should be a cast away we thank god paul was not a cast away eventually he said i have fought a good fight 
I have finished my course. I have run the race now. A crown of righteousness is awaiting me. And not only for me, but for all those who love the Lord. Like the Lord held Paul the Apostle until the very end. The Lord will help you. Amen. The Lord will help me. Amen. Say, the Lord will help me. And then, by His grace, in His strength, by His power, you run victoriously to the very end in Jesus' name. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Every detail of what we have learned, of what we have heard, take it freely and fully wholeheartedly unto the Lord in prayer so that the strength and the might and the grace of God will be multiplied in your life and you run the race perseveringly with commitment to the very end.